And you know, you just don't, you just don't understand, man. You just, you just don't, you, you just too tied to your relational <laughs> database model, man. You just, you're out of touch, man. You're just out of touch. Do you ever have issues crop up in production that you don't see in development? Do you even know how your app is performing in production? Performance, errors, and analytics to figure out where your app is bogging down are important to keep an eye on. You could try one of those error tracking apps, but why not use a tool that does it all? Try Datadog. Datadog tracks performance, collects data on your errors, and provides you with the information you need to improve your user's experience and fix bugs without having to log into the production server and dig through the logs. What if my app spans across multiple servers and services, you ask? Datadog seamlessly collects metrics from every corner of your application, including services like Amazon AWS and systems like Redis. So whether you want a clear view into your application's performance, need to be notified of new errors, or to keep track of your application across various services you use, use Datadog. If you go to devchat.tv slash Datadog and start a free trial, they'll send you a free Datadog t-shirt. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have Dave Kimura. Hi, everybody. Brian Hogan. Hello. Jerome Hardaway. It's good to be back. Yeah, we missed you. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. And this week, we're going to discuss front-end frameworks with web development. I think we're mostly going to talk about Rails, but you know, we may dig into some of these other areas as well if, if somebody else is using another framework. So I'm kind of curious just to kick this off. Who here, how many of you frequently use a front-end framework? In protest, I use with Rails, Angular, React, and Electron. And like I said, in protest. So In protest, what, is, what does that mean? <laughs> that means that I didn't want to use them and I felt like they were too much for what they were doing. But the person that wanted those projects done felt like you know, they wanted to be one of the cool kids and they wanted to use these frameworks. So, like, that's what that is in protest. Like, you know, against my will. I'm, you know, you're paying, but I guess. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm kind of on the same page. I don't want to sound like one of the old guys who's not with it and doesn't get it. What I find just fascinating is there's a lot of cases where I, I, I see – Lots of applications out there that look really look really nice and have this nice aesthetic to them, and they're nice these single page applications. But there isn't a day that goes by that I don't end up using one uh, from a, a a very very reputable uh, organization where something just breaks in the user interface, and I don't know why. And I think back to along the days when everything was server side generated. If something went wrong, you knew it. I mean, it wasn't pretty, and you lost some work, but at least you knew something was wrong as opposed to having to open up the web console and finding out that one of the JavaScript files didn't load or something like that. And so my my first reaction has always been, these JavaScript frameworks allow us to present user interfaces in the way that modern users expect. But it's incredibly difficult for us to get them done, and difficult means time-consuming, right? So if I'm trying to build an application and I'm trying to solve a business problem, I don't tend to start out thinking, yeah, I'm going to use a, a JavaScript framework. The places where I've ended up using a JavaScript framework, they've always been after I've got a working app. I've got a working user interface that's that's mostly server-side rendered. And then I'll start uh, taking the most important, um, heavily used features and seeing how I can improve upon them. But that's, that's sort of, again, it's based on my experience. If the big players can't quite get this front-end JavaScript framework stuff working uh, what what chance do I have? It may be somewhat pessimistic, but if I'm encountering errors every day where content doesn't load or something happened with a CDN and there's a couple of things fighting and the app becomes broken as a result, well, what chance do I have of getting that right? Is it that when you just go and create your own new JavaScript framework? Yeah. Right. Here it comes. <laughs> Hogan JS. Because, oh, no. There, that already exists. And that's not me. That actually is a thing. Oh, it is? Yeah, that actually is a thing. <laughs> But it's not. I have no affiliation with it. I guess it's some kind of a templating, uh, a templating framework. Uh, somebody said. Somebody actually said that in joke. They, they said, "Did you make your own?" I, that's. I have no, no idea what that is. But now I kind of want to use it just because. But no, I think I think it's it's really interesting because I know there are lots of folks that will reach for frameworks, and I think that's the that's the important thing we should focus on in this discussion is when is it really appropriate to use them, and and when isn't it appropriate? Because there's no denying that. In heavy workflow-based applications, it's really, really bad for the user experience to have a page refresh and then lose their spot. 
But it's also bad for things to just be wonky and not responsive because we're waiting on additional back end calls. Well, so and, when when do we when do we start when when do we use them when are when are some really good places for us to use them? I think well, um, just to throw that out there is a good starting place that maybe you should not have your framework your JavaScript framework picked out if you don't even have like a user story or an epic or a mock up like we we don't know what the app is what you want the app to look like then we should not really be focusing on the framework like the front end framework right off the bat so. I think we that needs to be mapped out a little more clearly before we decide already what type of technologies we're going to use. That's I disagree with that a little bit. And mainly it's just down to, I mean, the reason we pick Rails or the reason we reach, reach for Rails is because, A, yeah, we know it'll do the job, but B, it's familiar. And so we can get work done quickly. And so if you're familiar with Angular or React in a particular setup or configuration or Ember or something else, I, I see no reason why not to start there unless you know that it's not going to serve your needs. Here's the question I have with that, though. I mean, with Rails, there's so many batteries included that if I need to start displaying things to the user and providing providing things they can interact with, I can still certainly do that much quicker than I can trying to wire up all the components of a lot of the frameworks, right? Mm-hmm. So if my goal is to get immediate feedback so we don't so we don't burn money and burn time, doesn't it make sense to to defer trying to do things with the JavaScript framework and an API to at least get some feedback initially? It depends. And so here here's where I come in and kind of disagree with with some of the the standpoints here, but I think I think ultimately we're going to agree on a lot of this. So first of all, I know people who use Angular and, you know, similar frameworks to kind of build out and mock up the front end and they have mechanisms for essentially loading the data in. So, you know, you can more or less set up some of the, the data calls to just load static data like fixtures essentially and then you can mock up the data that way. So if, you, if you're looking for UI, I mean, you can do it either way. It just depends on which way you want to do it. There are things that make it much simpler in Rails, I will say, than in Angular or, or things like it. But... The flip side is, is that I think there are also levels to this that we're talking about. So if your entire UI is going to be managed by a front end framework because you need the kind of interactions and animations and, you know, just kind of the, the, the data binding and data management that is provided by the front end framework, then it makes a lot of sense to do that. So I see a lot of these setups that are essentially like dashboards and things like that where, you know, you, you interact with it in many different ways and it has a lot of moving parts. And that's just kind of the way that people interact and expect to be able to interact with an app of that kind. And so it makes sense to pull in Angular. I mean, that's, that's kind of a no-brainer in my opinion. You have a very highly interactive front end. You're going to need a front end framework to manage all that stuff. And then I also see people that tend to do things a little bit differently. And, and this is where I usually wind up using the front-end frameworks. So instead of having a fully managed front-end and Rails just being the API server, a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm just pulling in React or Angular components as part of my uh, application to give it the interaction right where I need it. And, you know, if they're shared state yeah. or common state on the front-end, then I'll manage it that way. And then I think yeah. the next rung down from that is something like TurboLinks or something where you have part of the page that gets reloaded or, um, you know, reworked as opposed to, you know, reloading the entire page. But it's not really managing any state. It's just reaching down to the server and saying, okay, what do I put here? And then finally you get down to the level where it's all just server rendered. And I, I think the front end frameworks work really well in the first two instances. In the second instance, I think you really do need to think about how much you're complicating your code versus how much interaction you're giving to your apps. But in the last two cases, I mean, those are both included in Rails, the server rendering and, and stuff like TurboLinks. So, you know, if, if that works for you, then yeah, why, why reach for something that just makes it that much more complicated to build your app? And I think it's also, you know, you have to look at your target audience. You know, think about if you're making a bingo application, you know, a web app, and so you know your target audience is going to be a bunch of older people. You know, admittedly, I've gone to play bingo before. It's pretty awesome. But, you know, I think most of the people there at a bingo parlor are a bit older. So if you make a online web application to attract them, 
then if you do it in a JavaScript framework, you're also relying on the client-side rendering and execution of all this JavaScript. So you're kind of relying that a end user has a decent computer or at least a decent enough computer to be able to run your JavaScript code. And, you know, if you're a target audience, most of them are still on Windows XP or some of them on Windows 98, then, you know, unless they have a recent browser, it's going to be a bad experience for them, most likely. So I think, you know, that's one consideration you have to take in as well. Then also, I don't know if you ever done any kind of JavaScript where you just had a bug in your JavaScript code and then on a front end framework, everything seems to just kind of die and crash and not work anymore because somewhere along the way you had a JavaScript error. So the entire application seems broken. But, you know, that would also be a concern as well using a client side framework. Yeah, because the, yeah, those 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 are the kinds of things I was I was discussing. There was an application I work with nearly every day, and it was rewritten to use a client side framework, and it's all it's all it's all static content driven. It's something that I have to use. I'm not going to out the people who did it. The people who did it are really smart people, but there's unfortunately a rogue third party component that they need to use that occasionally causes the application to fail, and and just things just stop loading. Or load halfway, and you, and you think things are fine, and then you realize that your data is not being saved. So, yeah. So, yeah. whenever I've worked on JavaScript frameworks and stuff, and someone said, "Hey, this feature is not working," one of my first questions is always, "What are some of the actions that you did that led up to you thinking that that feature doesn't work?" Because it's usually something else somewhere else in the application that they've done. The JavaScript broke because it's a single page application. You know, it has some negative trickle down effects or snowball effects on later parts of the application, which now appear to not work. You refresh a page and everything seems to work again. Yeah, there are tools for catching some of this. I feel like, I feel like, uh, yeah, it was funny because before the show, Dave's like, yeah, we're beating up on Dave. And now I feel like, okay, everybody's piling on front end framework. Thank you. No, 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 no. We're not going to let it. We're not going to let it go that far. <laughs> no, I, I don't feel like it's getting personal or anything. But I think it's interesting that that I'm the minority opinion here. But yeah, a lot of the front end frameworks have made it easier to debug a lot of that stuff. And as far as older browsers or older systems, typically the issue there is whether or not they have the current standards in JavaScript, etc. It it doesn't typically come down to resources because most of these front end frameworks are targeting mobile as well. And so if they're running Windows 98 or I don't know why anyone would do that these days, but, you know, Windows XP, I think, is a somewhat reasonable choice if, you know, if you're living in that space and, you know. Uh, you have to remember, yeah, yeah, you got to remember that your, your audience is not, it's not, yeah. it's, it's a privilege to be able to have fast computers and new computers. If you go into yeah. a lot of places where you're in, where there's, there's a poorer economy or uh, healthcare, healthcare mm-hmm. places, they just, they just don't have, they bought the. Fifteen million dollar MRI machines, for example, and they they outfitted their stuff with the budget they were given through a grant or something like that. You know, yeah, that happens. Still, that fifteen year old machine is plenty fast enough to do some of those things. A lot of the time, it's just the it's running IE eight or something. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, that's but. really usually what it comes down to. So it just doesn't have a current JavaScript engine in it or something like that. And so these front end frameworks, some of them tend not to polyfill which is just a library that shims in those features for older browsers, you know, back to whatever version those people are running. And so it, it really just comes down to their JavaScript engine. But yeah, I mean, overall, I, I think that really just comes down to knowing your audience, right? It, so in the example of the bingo, if you know that it's going to be older people on older machines, then yeah, you have to use an appropriate tool. But if you're building a modern application for a modern business, and, you know, they're expecting to be able to use the website like they use a regular application, then you may need a front end framework. Yeah, yeah I think I, and I think it's really, really important. One of the things that, that we sort of talked about was that a lot of these these frameworks really are trying to optimize for the mobile devices, too. Uh, and I think that's an advantage of looking at a framework as opposed to say, I'm going to roll my own by cobbling some jQuery scripts together or things like that. Because, again, that, that there are advantages to using frameworks. The question that I have for everyone is, OK, there's, you know, there's Angular. And there's React and there's Ember and there are so many different places where we, we have – we now have Rails developers that, that can't 
necessarily jump onto a different team because they've been working with Angular for four years and the new team is using React and they need people with React and Rails experience. How do you how do you choose the framework to use? How do you choose what front end framework to add to your Rails application? Yeah, and that was piggybacking to what I said earlier. That was my reasoning. You have a I don't I can speak for myself. I don't think everybody else might have had this yet. But when you're porting or people reach out to you for new projects, it's usually when they're talking about React or Angular, it's because they went to like a meetup and everybody was on fire about it. Or, you know, it's suddenly popular and we want we want this because it seems like everybody likes it. Well, does your project need it? We haven't put pen to paper to see what it does. And in the regards of that, I think when we I like the process of figuring out how do I want the app to behave before I decide which front end framework that we're using like if you know it's not going to be really heavy with the on the views where we're going to be doing a lot of and where we're not going to be super uh, mvc heavy but we're kind of trying to uh, incorporate a little more flux architecture then you know of course i'm going to use react but if we're going to be doing like angular cards or we want a lot of moving smaller pieces on top of a lot of moving bigger pieces then i'm going to go angular so i think that where the idea of mocking something up and seeing if you're you know uh, dhh they say it a lot on their books uh remote and rework you know and i view it the same but when it comes to uh development higher where it hurts and i think that's the same concept you need to do when it comes to web development, you only need to add something when it hurts like versus adding a bunch of stuff because it's cool or it's hot or it's the new it thing. And when I go into a lot of companies, that is where the uh, struggle point or the pain point is. Somebody heard well, something that was reading Wired or, you know, I was on a blog and they heard about this framework. But I'm like, all right, first, you know, it's like you might not even need jQuery. Well, yeah, you might not even need uh, Angular, or you might even need uh, React. You're doing something else that we can probably look into it and try to solve that problem that you're having on the UI side before we decide that we're going to, you know, just you know, slap a fresh new code of a framework on it and see what happens. This isn't something that's just uh, particular to you know to the web front end frameworks. That just happens to be the hot thing right now. But it's really, Jerome, you touched on something really important there. I, the idea that you know, who are you doing this for? You know, are you are you doing this for your users? Are you doing this for you? Are you are you are you trying to bring React into a project because you want to learn React so you can get a better job or a better position? Are you trying to use React because your friends are using React and they're making fun of you because you're still using jQuery? Uh, are you trying to appeal to people you look up to in the industry and trying to use what they use, or are you trying to solve the business problems that you're being paid to solve? I think those are questions that I always try to ask when I'm thinking about bringing on technology. Like, I love using Rails, and that's sort of my go-to tool, but I've caught myself many times going, this is the wrong choice. I love this choice, and I really want to use Action Cable because I've never used it before, but it's really the wrong choice for this project. Yeah, and I... I, I, I I want to say that that that's the tr that's the same thing with a lot of this this web front end stuff. I have seen many places that have used uh, my biggest pet peeve. And I'm going to keep harping on this. My biggest pet peeve is when I see someone like Ember or Angular used as to display like blog list or blog entries, static content that does not change, static content that has been it's been possible to serve with Apache on a Nintendo DS. You know, you, you don't need mm -hmm. a lot of horsepower to send me static pages that your CDN or some other layer can cache for you. So it doesn't make any sense to download an HTML page and then keep going back and forth over the wire to, to pull the content down, then use local processing power to transform the JSON into HTML that can be split on the page. That just doesn't make sense, and yet I see tons of examples doing that. And what Chuck said is that if you're going to be building an application, you know, you're trying to replicate the functionality of a of a desktop application. Uh, and even even to Dave's comment about the bingo, I think it probably I think I would probably still try to implement that with a front end framework because I'd want the responsiveness. I want the responsiveness there instead of the, the page flicker and the page reloading or something like that when I click on a square. That application versus content, that's the big sticking point for me. And it's also, who am I doing this for and what problem am I trying to solve? Yeah, yeah. from a real point that. of view, though, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff, you know, 
can be done with Turbolinks. Now, I know Turbolinks has gotten a bad rap over the past several years, but if you haven't tried it out recently, give it another shot. Like, it's pretty amazing. You know, I use it on all my applications, and it used to be something that, you know, admittedly, I would disable whenever I created a new app. And now it's something that I've learned to embrace and, you know, keep in my application and work with it instead of against it. So you can get a lot of the single page application feel in Rails with Turbolinks without the need of having a client side framework. And with Action Cable as well, Action Cable does add a extra level of complexity to your application. You know, it definitely does. Now you have other dependencies and then you have the Action Cable server that has to run. So there is some overhead there, but you can you can definitely use it instead of something like a long polling to push data back to the client over, you know, as a push or pub sub basis. So the direction that Rails has come over the past several years is pretty amazing. And I think a lot of the stuff that they've added does address a lot of the issues of, you know, JavaScript frameworks. But, you know, it's still, there are still some gaps with like the two way bindings of data and stuff, which I think a lot of the client side frameworks have handled and addressed really well. You just spoke to the, the history of Rails there. I mean, it, it, there were so many people that I've run across in the in the time I've used Rails that they had a bad experience with a component of Rails, and then they won't touch it ever again. And what I've learned of using Rails is you, you got to give any new feature, you got to give it a couple of a couple of cycles before it's really you know really come into its own. I'll probably start you, based on my previous experience with Rails. I'll probably start using Action Cable in Rails six. You know they'll they'll get it worked out. It's working pretty good right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, but you know there are still some nuances. But I think that you know, it's it's gotten pretty stable, in my opinion. You know, I'm still kind of worried about the performance issues of Action Cable, but I think that for starting out, if your application isn't huge and stuff, then, you know, it, it does work well, and it does scale horizontally with your application, you know, if you just bound it within the app. So, you know, you're not limited to a 1,000 requests per second, like some of the blog posts have said, if you scale it horizontally behind a load balancer. Yeah, well, and I think I think this is really a lot of the discussion that that a company should be having is, you know, they're like, well, Angular can do it or, you know, Turbolinks could do it or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever your other options are. Maybe you're going to custom build something around jQuery. But ultimately, in my opinion, yeah, you should be sitting down and saying, "Okay, well, how far can we go on Turbolinks? How how far can we go with Angular, you know? Is Angular overkill?" Or is it, you know, just right? Or do we only need certain parts of it? When we adopt Angular, do we want to be adopting TypeScript because most of the examples out there are written in it? You know, but but have those conversations. A lot of times people just jump in and yeah, like you, you've you all pointed out, it's like, well, this is the flavor of the day. I'm going to use React. And when it really comes down to it, it, you know, it may or may not be the right tool. Or maybe you need to hook a whole bunch of other stuff up to it in order to make it work. And, you know, yeah. It's like, well, what are the capabilities of TurboLinks? Because, yeah, I've heard a lot of the trash talk about it. But when it comes right down to it, I don't know if I've ever really taken advantage of TurboLinks because I just wasn't interested. I really wanted to do front-end frameworks. But I found that they have certain strengths in a lot of areas. And they're a little bit complicated for you to set up if you've never used one or used that particular one before if you're doing some really simple things. And so it, it, it really is a conversation about what do we need, what are we trying to build, and how does this get us down the road there and what is it going to cost us? Like, what are the trade-offs? So what you're saying is that y you have to do some discovery before you jump right into the code. Yep. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm shocked. <laughs> this is news to me. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of folks don't do it. I mean, they... No, no, they, they don't. They no. just, they get in, they get excited about the hot thing and that's it. Yes, that is probably, especially right now, I think as a Rails developer, that's like one of the more irritating things. Like, you know, people want to use Electron uh, for Rails now as well. And I'm like, all right, all right, so are we making a app to download on the internet? Like, why are we using Electron? Like, you know, it's really hard to get people to ask themselves, are they doing it simply because they want to do something new, cool, and different? Or are they doing it because the, their project or their product needs it? And... In the regards of front-end frameworks, I think as Rails developers, we need to start 
asking that question more. Like, what does this project need on the UI? What are we using or not using that the users have gotten accustomed to or this dial? So that is one of the things like, you know, it's all about people. We, we forget that, you know, while there are moments that programming is for, you know, fun and doing things. And when you're dealing with a business, it needs to be about incorporating business logic with the programming logic. So use um, the tools that can get you uh, to optimization to make money the fastest. So that is, or, you know, come profitable, uh, get gain profit as fast as you can. So that's something that we are right now in the rails and front end framework battle that we're just not seeing out there in the community. People want to do it. And, you know, I'm trying to stay neutral because, you know, some of my, the biggest fans that are coming to the show and including one of our favorites, he just right now he's in Amsterdam, one of our hosts. He's a uh, he's Angular on Rails, my favorite person we've spoken to on the show, Shocker Code. They, you know, they created a React on Rails gym. So I definitely understand the purpose of it. But when I, when you're out there in the wild, a lot of the projects are just because like, you know, Shocker Code, they are doing a really good job and, you know, getting React on Rails and, you know, advocating it for it in the space that it's for projects that actually need it versus, you know, people just throwing React on Rails on like something that would be fine being static. Like you said, like, oh, why are you using this when, you know, this blog post doesn't need it or something of that nature. So that is, I guess that's where we are all agreeing on. Like, you know, there does need to be some level of discovery before you throw it onto a, a project. I want to take y'all, I, I want to take y'all back to a simpler time back in 2010. Do y'all remember when everyone was saying, stop using MySQL and Postgres and use MongoDB because that's the way of the future and how everyone should be doing that. And if you're not, if you're not using it, you're doing it wrong. And you know, you just don't, you just don't understand, man. You just, you just don't, you're just too tied to your relational <laughs> database model, man. You just, you're out of touch, man. You're just out of touch. I'm hearing the same things that, you know, about the front end frameworks. You know, I, I've been doing JavaScript programming since 1995. I've been doing programming a lot longer than some of the, than, than a couple of the people I know have been alive. And yet I'm still getting the, man, you just don't get this whole React thing. And I'm, I'm no, I'm doing React applications. I'm writing them. And uh, I, I do I do get it because I've done every other possible way you can do this. I, I think that that contributes to the message. I think that contributes a little bit to the problem that we have, this fear of missing out this. If I don't learn this new thing, people are going to think less of me. People are going to take shots at my ability. I need to get on this bandwagon right now so I can be employable for the next gig. I think that contributes to it. I think that something as a community we can we can do to better support each other by encouraging discussion about is this really a good fit as opposed to just immediately knee jerking to man you just not just get with the times but that's the flaw of i mean that's one of the inherent flaws of community is that when something is cool you know it, you know bandwagon mentality right groupthink that is the problem that you're trying to solve and no one has ever solved that like, <laughs> if we were, you know, imagine the world if we had solved groupthink and bandwagon mentality, where we would be right now. But the thing is, we can't solve that. So how do we circumnavigate it when you're having the person like, you know, I don't know if like Charles, I'm pretty sure he started because he's in uh, Utah. So he's like in the middle of the country like I am. So I'm, I'm pretty sure when he started first programming and getting on shows, things of that nature, similar to myself. It was a lot harder to get to these bigger um, events because they already had this type of group thing that if you weren't on the East Coast in New York or Atlanta or D.C. or if you weren't in the Valley, then you didn't know tech like they knew tech. Like, you know, just like how if you don't use React or you're not a big proponent of React, like you're not a big fan of it. Oh, you just don't get it. Or, you know, you don't you're not a big fan of all the, you know, the JavaScript or the month club. You know, oh, you just don't get it. You're not <laughs> one of the cool yeah. yeah. So like how do we how do we deescalate and circumnavigate it? I think that is the better way for the solution is how do we deescalate and circumnavigate the situation? Like, all right, you are assuming that I don't get it because I am being a little more even killed about it. But while I'm not trying to disrespect your point of view, what I want to share is here are my point of views backed by, you know, experience and data and things of that nature. 
how do we get the person to listen? Because, you know, um, uh, Ryan's probably been this like, oh, you just don't get it. Uh, I don't care. Like, you know, precious goes on tangent. Like, okay, you're not even listening. So we can't even have a conversation at this point. <laughs> um, I- yeah, I mean, I think I think the the place that the place that I started a couple of years ago is I saw there were two presenters that I really liked. I was I was enjoyed their presentations for very for very different reasons. I always enjoyed, you know, DHH's everything is wrong. This is the better way to do it. But I also enjoyed Wise stuff, which is more of, hey, I think this is cool. I'm going to share it with you. And that's in my small way of helping. That's the approach I tried to take. In in my more recent years as as a software developer, is hey, I think this is cool. And I want to share it with you, and I'm I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna tell you that you should use it, but I'm gonna tell you that I'm using it instead of instead of this because I think it's working well for me. Uh, yeah, and, and it's, it's less of a trying to convince you and more of a I think this is cool and I'm sharing it with you. You know, we need the bandwagons. You know, to some degree, we really do. Otherwise, I think that we'll just get stagnant in our technology. You know, if we don't have bandwagons, and I don't think Rails, you know, Rails would never have gotten the hype. Ruby wouldn't have gotten the hype that it got. And, you know, this podcast probably wouldn't exist if it weren't for Rails. You know, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Chuck, but I mean, if we didn't have those kind of bandwagons, you know, I probably would not be a developer because it's it is that newest and greatest uh, thing or that new framework that's all shiny and stuff that gets people attracted to something and then they start getting committed to it. So to some degree, we do need the bandwagons to kind of keep moving forward. However, I think that we can do it with respect with of each other. You know, if we start bashing people because they're not using a particular language or framework or, you know, editor or something, you know, whatever it is, then I think that we are going to push people away who really could have contributed to the community. You know, yeah, there are a lot of people that I know personally that will not touch Ruby simply because of the way that Ruby kind of came on the scene. They're, they just they won't even look at the language. They don't they won't look at the beautiful awesomeness of the Ruby language because, you know, they were all told, oh, you're all dinosaurs for using Java. And that's a terrible thing. And don't do that. You know, or dot net's bad. And I'll admit to being part of that in the early days because I kind of got caught up in the bandwagon. Uh, yeah, that's one of the one of those one of those little advantages that you get from being able to look back on things with experience. Yeah. One thing that I see, though, I mean, some of this is, yeah, okay, everybody's talking about this thing, so I need to go use it, right? And then there are other people that are a little bit more even-tempered, I guess, and so they, they're they like, well, I'm at least going to go check it out. But some of the bandwagon is hype, and some of the bandwagon is, hey, I went in, and this is a lot easier, simpler, solves my problem better, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so from that standpoint... I don't know. I mean, so so some of it is people jumping on the bandwagon because it's a bandwagon. Some people are jumping on the bandwagon because it actually solves a problem. And so, Uh, and and I feel like Rails did that, right? It made web development a ton easier. Well, I think that's what, that's what's important about when you're marketing something and when it's, when you're teaching something is to make a, don't just say this is awesome. Make a connection to why this is going to make my life better. Yeah. It really don't, don't just tell me that I should use React because I'm out of touch. Show me how React will make the application that I'm building better. Help me, help me see that. Don't just tell me that I need to use that. that I, I, I've had arguments with people like, "Oh, you're still rendering HTML from the server side. Oh, that's so that's so old, all out of out of fashion. You need to have an API now, and you need to have a, a JavaScript front end." And all I can think of is, you haven't in any of those words told me how that's going to make my application better for me or my customers. Yeah, one example <laughs> uh, that I have is that you know I have an Angular podcast, and so I've been wanting to you know, kind of get up on the latest things in Angular. And one thing that I've I've run into is I was like, okay, well, I'm going to build this app. Well, in Angular, and I I thought about it, and I was like, you know what, if I do this in Rails, I don't need Angular, right? Because each page is kind of its own thing, and it'll just render out properly. Anyway, it's just been kind of interesting, because yeah, it was like, okay, well, then I need to find a different example that actually makes sense to use it. Because there are example apps out there where it makes sense. So instead of doing something that's just, you know, here's the data, display the data, it's, okay, well, I'm going to interact with the screen in a specific way. You know, I'm, so I was thinking like a Trello clone, for example. Yeah, yeah, you know. it's a great example. 
you know, no, but, uh, but instead of the, you know, I, I, the other one was a social sharing app, but it's like, you know, you come to the page and it's going to, yeah, it's, it's just going to be handled properly. And so I, I completely agree with you there. This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Are you searching for a new job? That can be stressful, scary, and time-consuming. Pushy recruiters try to sell you on roles you don't actually want, and the job boards make you feel like you're throwing your resume into a black hole, never to be seen again. And sometimes you go all the way through the interview process just to find out at the very end that the salary, offer, or company culture doesn't match what you're looking for. Hired is the world's most intelligent talent matching platform for full-time and contract opportunities in engineering development, design, product management, data science, sales, and marketing. We make your job search faster, focused, and stress-free. Instead of endlessly applying to companies and hoping for the best, Hired puts you in control of when and how you connect with compelling new opportunities. After completing one simple application, top employers apply to hire you. And on Hired, you receive personal interview requests and upfront salary information so you can make informed decisions about what opportunities to pursue over a condensed timeline. Hired offers access to more than 4,000 innovative employers, including big brand names like Facebook and smaller emerging startups. The size and type of company you want to connect with is totally up to you. And we help you find new opportunities in 17 major cities in North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Open to relocation? Let them know. Your privacy and autonomy in your job search is of utmost importance. And if you sign up today using the show's link, that's hired.com slash rubyrogues, you can get double the normal hiring bonus. That's $600 instead of $300. So go check them out at hired.com slash rubyrogues. I definitely agree as well. Funny story, going back to that whole, I think Brian would love this, that whole argument about, you know, you're a dinosaur, you're doing things old school. I'm called a dinosaur in a, many, in a lot of ways when it comes to tech, because I, you know, some of the things I do, like in regards to servers and stuff, they consider old fashioned, like old fashioned hosting an FTP. I was getting made fun of by um, a friend who's a React developer and he has this really cool startup that you know, our nonprofit uses and he was just making fun of us because he's like, oh, yeah, I still do this. And you're not doing AWS and all this other stuff. And I was like, well, no, because I don't see the purpose of using it. Well, the AWS situation where like half of the half of the apps went down due to like one line of code being deleted, which is hilarious when you think about all the QA and stuff that Amazon has to do for something like that to still happen. They one of their their sites was one of the apps that went down and our app was like up and like our website was up and thriving and fine. And I was like sending them a text message and I was like, so we didn't go down today. How are you? So like there's a lot of ways where you're like, you know, the old ways still work and knowing how to do those things are, you know, stuff that you need to that's things you need to know because you can't always depend on the new shiny object all the time because it it will break. Like that's one thing that about new things that you can depend on is that everything that's new will break and you might need to wait to the third or, or fourth iteration before it becomes something like before it becomes stable, but trust that the new stuff will break. So you need to know the old things and have a backup for that as well. Well, um, it, yeah. is, it isn't even, it isn't even just that, right? It's, it's the, the infrastructure is now in somebody else's control and you're at their mercy. Now you should, of course, you not put all your eggs in one basket. You should distribute things, right? But this goes for JavaScript frameworks too. You bring a, several thousand lines of somebody else's code into your business application. The boss or your customers really aren't going to care if there's a bug in the framework. They're going to see this as a bug in your application. So it's it's incumbent upon you for every tool that you bring into a project to have at least an understanding of how it works. It's not magic. It's something that you don't understand yet. And whether it's deploying to somebody else's cloud or bringing in someone else's JavaScript framework, just know that that's, that's something that you, you have to deal with at some point. You might save time now, but you might lose some of that time later if you're not prepared and at least aware that that's the case. I've, I've been bitten many times by a bug in Rails or a bug in jQuery, and it's never been acceptable in my career to say, oh, I can't fix that because that's a, that's a, a component we're using. Nobody, nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that we, when we teach uh, Node, we bring up that uh, incident with the guy with the package who he just ripped it off of the left pad. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, when he did it, like half of like all those apps went down. Like, you know, there are, that's why we try to keep it like 
our project, which I try to tell our, our students to keep their projects package alike, because like you want to have as much of your code as possible in your projects. So when situations like that go down, you're not looking, trying to, you know, everybody was pointing fingers, but in the end it was their app. So you, you know, you had to, you know, you have to handle it. And that's one thing that we're trying that we push on our students, like, you know, stuff like that happens. So you have to deal with it. You know, you don't, you don't want to be, you don't want to be terrified to use other people's code. You know, you, you do, there, there are going to be lots of places where it is going to be a better use of your time to bring somebody else's stuff in. It's going to be a better use of your time. If you're building, if you're building a, a real time, real time application, it's really going to be worth your time to bring in somebody else's WebSocket library that's trusted and used by hundreds of thousands of people than it would be for you to roll your own because you don't want to worry about dependencies because what if it goes down? But that said, you should at least know enough about what you're bringing in to know that if something breaks, you can fix it, you can update it. Because one of the things that people always forget is, yeah, you want to get to market fast. You want to solve your business problems fast. But that also means you want to solve future business problems fast. So six months from now, when a new requirement comes up, do you have the ability to address that quickly? Do you can you so you can push out the next feature quickly? This is that whole topic of technical debt, right? And so that's one of the things that I always think about when it comes to I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna use this uh, JavaScript framework or whatever framework. Right now, I'm 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 spending almost all of my free time working with Elm instead of JavaScript because I've decided after all these years I'm tired of JavaScript and I, I really want something different. And Elm is serving that purpose for me. But one of the things I continuously have to think about is I don't really know this language well enough yet. I mean, I'm, I'm relatively new to it and I'm looking at places where this is wor working really well now, but six months from now when I have to add a new feature, how hard is that going to be? How difficult is that going to be? How challenging is that going to be? Uh, am, I, am I shooting myself in the foot here by not really understanding what it is that I'm doing and using? And I worry that that because of the, the constant deluge of new technologies and new things changing, I, I'm always a little worried that developers just aren't getting enough time to spend to really learn the tools they're bringing into their projects. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, we should all do our due diligence. You know, if you are bringing in a gem or a package, you know, check it out. Look to see what it's actually doing. And make the choice, you know, is this something that I'm willing to bring into my application and not have to worry about maintaining? You know, for example, earlier this week, I was looking at doing some uh, server-side processing for data tables to just speed up some areas of an application that I'm working on. And I found a Ruby gem that kind of magically does it for you. But when I started looking at the gem's code, I'm like, there's not enough in here to warrant to actually bring this gem in. You know, I can copy out the relevant pieces of code that I like that would, you know, save me a bit of time, but the rest of the gem, it's it's not worth bringing in. You know, there's not enough features or stuff happening that I really need, and therefore I'm essentially going to raise my technical debt of having this gem in here that I'm going to rely on the maintainer to maintain instead of having my own rolled solution you know, baked into the application. So, you know, I think it, to everyone's point, it does take merit to review the code to see what you're actually doing or bringing in. And to one of your earlier points, Jerome, about, you know, kind of doing stuff the old way, I do think that there has to be a line drawn in the sand somewhere. Like, if you're still doing, like, post backs on your application for everything, then, you know, you probably need to get up with the times you know, and do stuff a little bit more modern, but... Oh, hold on now, hold on now. We just talked about <laughs> not, not doing it to people, so why? Why is why is a generalized statement like, if you're still doing postbacks in your application, why do I need to get with the times? If that's solving the problems for the customers, if that's solving the problems for the users, if that's solving the problems for the business, what's the advantage of not doing that? To me, postbacks have always kind of been a little bit shaky with the view state. I've never... Sure really like them. I think that it you also lose visibility on your on your calls, you know. So the post facts really didn't have much to do with uh uh MVC framework. So, you know, it's kind of a mm -hmm. little bit of a different time. Yeah. You know, 10, 15 years ago. So it's 
definitely a old style of coding. You yeah. know, it's not something that you really see on, on modern applications anymore. You know, a lot of any kind of modern web application is most likely using some kind of framework because those frameworks have decided or they have proven to solve a fundamental issue with the way things were being done back in the day. So, you know, I do think that we do have to have at some point to say this way of doing something is old. You should not do it anymore. You know, you should not design your web pages in front page or Dreamweaver anymore because the technical debt that you will incur. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It took me a second to remember what that Microsoft web yeah. web builder was. <laughs> yeah, uh, I had a student. But it. it's burning in my it's burning in my brain. I I didn't want to put you on the spot there, Dave. But I I, I wanted to draw out that, that I think it, it, when we say things like that, it's really important to say, here's why. It, it's oh no, mm-hmm. absolutely. I mean, I'm guilty of that all the time. I'm guilty of that I always leave off. I, I leave off the why. I've been trying to be better about that, but it, it's one of those things where. So, so seriously, why shouldn't we do, why shouldn't you use FTP anymore? You know, yeah, you shouldn't use FTP. Don't just, don't just say, don't use FTP. Oh my God, don't use FTP. It's, Hey, someone could, someone could swipe your, your, your password when you're making that connection and then you'd be, you'd be compromised and you should use, you should use a secure FTP instead or something like that. You don't just want to go around and say, no, this is the old way. Don't do it the old way. Yeah, there are, there are legit advantages to to moving up. And if I'm doing a web application right now, what I'd be doing, what I'd be using postbacks, heck no. Uh, <laughs> but if I'm maintaining an existing application, the question I would have for the team is: so, so if we're going to add a new feature to the application, do we still use postbacks, or do we now end up with a you know six months from now, do we now end up with a mix of some of the application uses postbacks and some of the application uses a different a different way of doing it? How, how do you reconcile those kinds of things? So I think the the person that's listening, when they hear "don't do X," uh, they might go, "But but I, I have to do X." Like, don't don't write COBOL, but you know, I have to write COBOL. That's what our business uses. All right. So I have a question. I would like to, you know, I guess do a mock. I guess a mock, a mock selling point for this. Number one reason why most Rails developers and Rubyists are against the front end frameworks is because they hate JavaScript. Like that's probably the number one reason that they became Ruby is because they, from when I talk to people, number one reason they chose Ruby is because they hated JavaScript. Number two reason is they hated PHP. So. <laughs> I love uh, it. Sorry. Uh, guilty. <laughs> I mean, well, we've all, we've all had that pain, right? We use something else. It kind of sucked. We went to Ruby and it sucked less. Yeah. That's, yeah pretty much the story and so any any amount of javascript that they have to write is almost like pulling teeth so how do we get a you know primarily ruby or you know they they can do it all they can work in uh, sinatra they can work in uh rails so i'm like hey you know what maybe you can try to push your your ui on your on the front end side and use react or angular how do we convince that guy that hey yeah. take you know, take this, you know, take a chance, you know, build one of these. I like think outside of- it's a really great question. And I think the the answer to that is right inside of right inside of Rails already. Why is Rails so easy for us to build things? Because there are some conventions it follows and there are some things it generates for us. You know, if if I could just if I could just have a command that generates me all the files in the right place for my JavaScript front end application, that would be a huge win. And finally, we have that in Rails 5.1. We have that with the, the, the Webpack. Uh, we can do Rails new, my app, Webpack equals React. And boom, everything is set up and there's a React component right in the right spot that I can start monkeying around with. I think that's the thing that that we always forget is you, you, you're starting to see this now with the front end frameworks. They're all starting to have the little CLI project generators and things like that. They're finally, rather than just go to someone's blog page and copy in a bunch of Webpack configuration that you don't understand, they're finally giving you some tools that do the same thing. You know, here's a bunch of stuff we're going to put in your project you don't understand, but at least they're not making you do it manually and cobble, cobble together and pray. Uh, I think that's the thing that's been missing is the ease of use of getting something up and bootstrapped and working to get that quick win that you feel like when you have Rails. That's at least my opinion. I'm, I'm sure you all have other opinions on that. 
Yeah, I think you're pretty spot on, Brian. But, you know, my biggest thing against a JavaScript framework isn't so much the JavaScript portion, which, you know, admittingly, that is a, you know, one of my grievances with it. But it's more that I'm putting too much business logic in the view. You know, I'm giving too much visibility of the business logic in the view. And that's just not really something that's ever really sat well with me. Yeah, but sometimes you need to. And and that's the, that's where I'm going to is, you know, sometimes it it just needs to understand like not all of the business logic, but enough of the business logic so that if you change something over here, it fixes everything up everywhere else and everything works out nicely that way. And and not all apps need that. Not all apps need to, you know, transform based on what you're doing or what you've changed in a form or anything like that. But when you need it, you need it. And, and yeah, if you don't need it, then yeah, I agree with you. You know, it's like, okay, I've, uh, overkill, right? All right. Well, to piggyback and continue on that, like this um, strain of this thought process, what in the regards of, you know, they already don't like JavaScript. You've got them to use one of the frameworks, but now they're like, oh, I haven't learned TypeScript or CoffeeScript to use this framework uh, properly. All everything that I'm trying to learn or all the uh, tutorials out there are in either CoffeeScript or TypeScript, like Brian said, like, you know, Angular is pretty much mostly written in TypeScript. So how do you get someone who already, they already hate JavaScript. Now they have learned a front end framework in JavaScript and they have learned a kind of pseudo language. Oh, like here's Babel, here's ES6, here's CoffeeScript, TypeScript, and, you know, Brian's on the Elm train, like, so you might want to just throw all that out away and just use Elm. How do we convert those people who, you know, they just, they have an adverse, like, what I am seeing is people are wanting to go back to, like, some type of simplicity and normalcy when it comes to programming, being like, I'm, you, I'm seeing this uh, trend where people were at one point running towards JavaScript frameworks. And now they're running back towards like things that are just it's almost like they want a simpler time. Uh, they want to remember the days of yore where they, there wasn't a new uh, product dropping that they felt like they had to learn um, every day. So how do you pitch that to a, a more senior developer that, you know, they've been in their career for a minute and they don't feel the need to learn that, learn all this different new stuff? Not just the frameworks, but the type of languages that end up in the end pretty much compiling into JavaScript. Yeah, I feel like we've we've kind of covered a lot of that in just the sense of, okay, what are the problems we're trying to solve and how does this particular tool solve it? Yeah, I think that's the one of the most important things to get people to to get on board with an idea is to not is to not try to sell the technology. There's a really great blog post from Buffer, and you can find that it's actually just kind of popped up again. It's from 2014, but it popped up again in the last few days on Hacker News and other places. Uh, and it's about you know people don't people don't buy products; they buy better versions of themselves. And that applies to you know to, to technology stacks too. It applies to when you're trying to convince someone to to adopt a new piece of technology. It is is think about how much better this is going to make the application. How it will improve the workflow. It, it will have will have less bugs. You know things like that. The, that's that's how I have had success convincing other developers who might not otherwise want to jump on board. Awesome, I'm taking notes. That's the way I can use it for, uh, against older devs later. So thank you. Yeah, I agree. And a lot of times too, I'll you know I'll go talk to other people. It's like I'll go to the users groups and I'll be like, hey, we got this problem. How do we solve it? And, you know, they may show me how to do it in one of these front end frameworks or one of these other tools or show me how TypeScript makes that particular problem mostly go away. And so then I can come back and I can say, hey, I talked to this person at the users group. He, you know, he showed me all this stuff. It looks really great. And sometimes I've actually worked things out. So that person then comes in and spends a couple hours with us. You know, the company writes him a check and they show us how to solve the problem with whatever tool. I mean, it's not like you have to go and reinvent the wheel once you decide to use one of these frameworks either. And so, you know, if make the investment, make the investment in your own skills, make the investment in uh, your team skills, and don't be afraid to bring somebody in to show you how to make it work with whatever tools are out there. 
unless if it's a JavaScript framework. So we, yeah, so we're we're all we're all on. So the result the result of this conversation is that JavaScript frameworks are neither good nor bad. They're it depends. Is that what we're going to come up with? With they our, are a necessary evil. Oh, they're like cardio. <laughs> oh, like JavaScript in the same boat as cardio. Okay. Like you d- <laughs> might might not want to do it, but you kind of have to if you want to. I don't know. Keep. And let's keep alive in your the industry with JavaScript. Cardio is like, well, you kind of don't want to do it, but you might, you definitely need to if you want to like live to like sixty or seventy. So I think, like, I that's, think that's, that's that's a pretty that's a pretty interesting. I like I kind of like that. That's a pretty interesting way of a way of looking at it. it was, it's also just meeting those, meeting the meeting the expectations of the people who are using your application. A lot of them are spending their time on Facebook, which is a highly you know, dynamic, interactive. An environment where they don't they don't refresh the page, new data just shows up to them, and that's sort of the expectation. You, you ask them, "Oh, I want to see new results." I have to, you have to refresh the page. What they don't they don't understand that anymore. That's just and, and so in order to meet the needs, and until WebAssembly becomes something that everyone can take advantage of, JavaScript is the name of the game in town. It's the only option you have to deliver those kinds of experiences, and you, you got to use it. When, when, when you're trying to deliver those kinds of experiences, you have to use it. I just really hope that people don't don't reach for it when it's not a necessary thing. Yeah, and I'll just chime in because I really enjoy working with Angular in particular. And I don't always use it. I mean, sometimes I'm building an app and it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense for me to pull something like that in. So I wouldn't go so far as necessary evil, but it does seem like that's the direction that a lot of the industry is heading. And I wanted to ask this as part of this conversation too then, and that is since there are segments of the the industry that are heading in this direction where they want these front-end frameworks in their applications, you know, whether they're well-informed decisions or not, do you feel like then for people's careers they have to go out and learn one? Or can you still get by as a Rails developer for the next five years without knowing Angular, React, Vue, whatever else is out there? Well, I think that's a really tricky question, right? Because you just listed off four different frameworks there. Can I know them all well enough? Yeah, I think it's good to be familiar with them. You know, yeah. more than just, oh, I've heard of it. No, I think everyone should give them a shot because, you know, even if you revert back to just using Action View and TurboLinks and stuff like that, you will have seen something in Angular or React or Vue, you know, some framework that you're like, you know what, I've never thought of that before. That concept is going to greatly help me out with my application. So there's always something good that you can take away, even if you're not going to buy into that uh, flavor of JavaScript framework. Yeah, that's my point of view. I, I tell our troops, like, you know, try it out, build a project with it. If you hate it, you hate it. If you love it, that's great. But at least you'll have that experience when your ability to be able to talk about it intelligently. In the same way with Rails, like, you know, there are plenty of like projects out there or tutorials out there or books out there that focus on using front end frameworks with Rails. You can even, especially like with Charles, he likes to use an Angular. So, you know, there was a book out there that was like using Angular with Rails. And then, you know, we have Jason Sweat with Angular and Rails. We also have React and Rails now, Express on Rails. I haven't really seen a lot of talk about Vue.js with Rails. So now I'm going to be out there looking for that. Um, Ember. So just take a shot, like maybe once a month, just do a project out there with one of these front-end frameworks and using Rails as the back end. That way you, you, you can talk about it intelligently. And you can just have that on your resume because if you've done it once be, or you have it in your GitHub, I guess is the best way to say it. So that way you can, you know, have it once and be done with it. You know, it's like a Band-Aid, rip it off. And, you know, you're going to hate it, but or you might love it. So <laughs> just go whichever route you want to go. Yeah, I'm just going to pile on with what Jerome is saying because ultimately, I mean, this is what you do, right? It's, it's what you do for work um, at the very least. And for a lot of us, it's something we do for fun too. And, you know, it, it kind of harkens back a little bit to pragmatic programmer and learn a new language every year. I mean, there's, there's no harm in learning one of these frameworks. And then, yeah, if, if, if you like it, then you can stick with it. And if you don't, then you don't. But the thing is, is that even though I'm pretty well in the Angular camp right now, I have been trying to learn some React. 
And it's not because there's some kind of, I feel like some kind of framework war or something. Instead, what it really boils down to for me is that, you know, there are ideas over there that are going to help me get better over here. And if I wind up liking React more, then I can switch. And that, that's, you know, there's nothing wrong about doing that either. You know, I, I've heard a few people regret or express guilt over switching to Elixir from Ruby. And, you know, it's just, hey, well, it's just a tool. Is the tool working for you and doing what you want? And so, again, I mean, if this is what you do and this is where you're going to invest your career, then find out what's going on over there. And then if it turns out, you know, I have no interest in working in that land, then, you know, then continue to focus on the back end stuff. But if, you know, if it turns out that that is something that interests you, then go for it. Yeah, you know, it's not going to hurt you to look at something new. You know, just don't go putting on your resume that you are a React or Angular expert if you create a Hello World app, you know, because... That's not going to help anyone. But, you know, give it a fair shot. And then go back and use interval links in action view. Yep. <laughs> or or whatever what? makes sense. I'm yes, going to. Exactly. Every time that I've seen turbo links, I just disable it. So I'm going to, <laughs> this weekend, I'm going to, just for you, I'm going to do a app in, tur- in turbo links because. You'll you know, thank I, me later. I know, right? Like, it's probably the best thing. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm like, why haven't I been doing this? Like, what's wrong with me? Uh, I have a lot of Rails work I have to do this weekend anyway. So I'm going to see what happens. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do some picks. This episode is sponsored by Compose.io. Compose is a fully managed database hosting with extra security, scaling, and performance. Hosted on dedicated SSD servers, you can pick from nine highly available databases, MongoDB, Elasticsearch, Redis, Compose Enterprise comes with easy scaling, which means you can add additional nodes at any time. It's auto-scaled resources like storage, memory, and IOPS, RESTful APIs, central console to manage all your deployments, and premium support with guaranteed response time and priority ticketing. With Compose Enterprise, you can free up your time to focus on building your app instead of managing your database. Check them out at enterprise.compose.com. And if you try Compose, you'll get a free special edition t-shirt. Hurry, quantities are limited. That's enterprise.compose.com. Why don't you go first, Jerome? All right. Um, I got three picks that I have already selected. My first one is more technical. Uh, I try to keep my picks a little closer towards thought leadership as well as technical um, prep. So my first technical pick is Eddie Edibit. Uh, it's a new code challenge uh, website, is, uh, especially for those who are, getting, you know, who are newer in programming. It has a lot of more thought processes built into it, so that way that the you can see the resources that, that you need to research for uh, for your code challenge as well as uh, go into a forum and ask questions so at a bit.com that is my first pick my second pick is from muse it's called the new rules of work it is a great book that help people like navigate how environment, uh, how the new working rules of env- uh, work and freelance, remote work, things of that nature, especially for uh, people who are just now getting into this field. And, you know, oh, there's so many options. Do I want to sit in the office? Do I want to, you know, roll out of bed and just go down the hall or do I want to work uh, at like a co-work space, something like that? So it's a great uh, great book, especially for all the new grads out there um, in computer science. So congrats to all the new grads. I think like 50K. We had like 50,000 people uh, graduate with computer science in the country this year. So that's kind of cool. And the third book is uh, Extreme Ownership, or my third pick, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willilink, Navy SEAL. Uh, he does a lot of leadership company training. Uh, it's an amazing book. And you know, it just it helps make you from every level of your lifestyle a better leader so those are my three picks awesome brian what are your picks all right i just have two and the first pick is going to be elm well we've talked about javascript front end frameworks but elm is something that i encourage everyone to take a look at because it will if nothing else really change how you start thinking about putting your front-end application together. If you've used React, you're going to find some similarities between Elm and uh, React with uh, with Flux. Especially if you use something like Redux, you'll see a lot of similarities. Using Learning Elm over the last year has helped me uh, with my React applications that I'm working with a little bit. So in just that that way, it's it's quite nice. It changes how you think about constructing your front-end. And it also 
plays really nicely with Rails. The the, the Rails 5.1 with the Webpacker component. If you grab the absolute latest version of that gem, you can create a Rails application that has the the Elm stuff already set up for you. And uh, it's it's been really interesting to to try to put the two together. I'm really enjoying the experience with that. So there's a great there's a great I'm not affiliated with this in any way. There's a great online video course from the Pragmatic Studio. My Mike and Nicole Clark put that together. It is a fantastic way of learning uh, learning Elm. It's really really uh, inexpensive to purchase the course, and they also offer a free video free video course on integrating Elm into an existing JavaScript application. They show several ways that you can do that. Uh, and that, that free course is you'll learn a ton just from that little free course too. So I, I really strongly encourage everyone to take a look at this. Uh, join me uh, join me in Elm. It's it's a blast. Um, the other thing I uh, I'm going to pick is a little command line usually called durenv. And it's not really necessarily a new thing, but if you find yourself and if you find yourself with multiple projects and you have to keep putting API keys in your environment variables to use with different scripts like Terraform or other things. Maybe you don't want to put those all in your dot profile or your bash profile or other files. Uh, Durand lets you just have a little dot env file in your current directory, in your current project directory. Um, and when you change directories, it just loads those things in your environment. When you leave the directory, it unloads those things from your environment. There are some Rails plugins and, and Node plugins that kind of do this for your application so that the environment variables get loaded from a file into your application. But this this does it at a more operating system-based level. So you don't, uh, they'll just be in your environment. There's no additional things you have to do. So it's language agnostic. And so you can use it for API keys for cloud providers too. It's just a really, really fantastic tool to have in your in your toolbox if you spend a lot of time using API keys and whatnot on your on your command line. Sweet. All right, Dave, what are your picks? All right, I just have two picks. One is this little preamp that I got this week, which has been pretty awesome. It's a PreSonus two pre version two or V two amp, and it basically takes in my microphone cable into this thing before it goes into the mixer and it does a really clean amplification of the mic audio. So I've really been impressed with it. It's pretty awesome. And my second pick is a, I don't know how you install it on a non Mac computer, but it's a Git open. And so I often need to launch my GitHub page of a project that I'm working on. And so Git open, it works with GitLab, works with Bitbucket and GitHub. You can just, within the directory that you're in, type git open, and then it'll launch the relevant URL, takes you to that web page or to the version control. So it saves me a bit of time, and it's pretty awesome. All right, I'm going to jump in with a couple of picks. The first one is a book. It's actually a trilogy that I've been enjoying. My wife recommended it to me. It's anyway, I don't know what the name of the trilogy is, but The Wretched of Muirwood, the Blight of Muirwood and the Scourge of Muirwood. And anyway, kind of a different magic system, interesting series of, a different, kind of a different uh, book series. But I really enjoyed it, so I'm going to pick that. I've also been reading another book, which is really interesting that I've been enjoying. It's called The Vanishing American Adult by Senator Ben Sass from Nebraska. And it's not really, I, I know some people are going to hear that and they're going to think, okay, you know, it's a conservative indictment of the entitlement, blah, 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 blah. It's not really a political book. He talks about some of the things that he's noticed out there and then has talked about some of the solutions that you can implement in your family to kind of uh, build that sense of responsibility and hard work and things like that in, in your family with your kids. And, and anyway, I've, I've really been enjoying that as well. And anyway, I'll pick another book, too. It's called Giftology, The Art and Science of Giving. And that one's by John Rulin. And it's also really, really great. And then finally, I'm going to pick a gem. And this gem kind of saved my bacon because I, I had to work on an app that I had built a few years ago. It was still in Rails 4 point something. And uh, it's the Pessimize gem. And so when I uh, pulled it onto a new machine and installed stuff, it just installed the right versions and mostly just worked. Upgrading has been kind of a pain upgrading it to Rails 5, but, uh, you know, the pessimized gem just made it basically run right. So I'm happy with that, and I'm going to pick that. Should have called the Honey Badger IO guys for that one. Like, those dudes, they're rock stars in upgrading Rails apps. Yeah. Yeah, I ran into those guys a few months ago. Yeah. 
they uh, they did coat pins rails out. They updated, yep. they did all the upgrades for them. So nice. All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap this one up, and we will catch you all next week. Talk to y'all later. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more.